So are you all ready for another installment of Lassie Come Home? I am hoping to get through the end of this this time. There are two chapters left, left, one long and one short. We're gonna see how long it takes us to read. So hopefully we can wrap it up tonight. Um, so if you recall, Lassie and Rolly parted ways. Uh, Lassie got caught in the snow, in the snowstorm and was super tired and exhausted and getting buried by snow as she just couldn't trudge through it any further. So what happens next? The title of the chapter is called Journey's End. Sam Caraclaw had spoken the truth early that year when he told his son Joe that it was a long way from Greenall Bridge to Yorkshire to the Duke of Redling's place in Scotland. Oh, Greenall Bridge in Yorkshire to the Duke of Redling's place in Scotland. And it is just as many miles coming the other way, a matter of 400 miles. But that would be for a man traveling straight by road or by train. For an animal, how far would it be? An animal that must circle and quest at obstacles, wander and err, backtrack and sidetrack until it found a way? A thousand miles it would be. A thousand miles through strange terrain it had never crossed before, with nothing but instinct to tell direction. Yes, a thousand miles of mountain and dale, of highland and moor, plowland and path, ravine and river, and beck and burn. A thousand miles of tor and bray, of snow and rain and fog and sun, of wire and thistle and thorn and flint and rock to tear the feet. Who could expect a dog to win through that? Yet, if it were almost a miracle, in his heart, Joe Caraclaw tried to believe in that miracle, that somehow, wonderfully, inexplicably, inexplicably, his dog would be there someday, there, waiting by the school gate. Each day, as he came out of school, his eyes would turn to the spot where Lassie had always waited. And each day there was nothing there, and Joe Careclaw would walk home slowly, silently, stolidly, as did the people of his country. Always, when school ended, Joe tried to prepare himself, told himself not to be disappointed, because there could be no dog there. Thus, through the long weeks, Joe began to teach himself not to believe in the impossible. He had hoped against hope so long that hope began to die. But if hope can die in a human, it does not in an animal. As long as it lives, the hope is there and the faith is there. And so, coming across the schoolyard that day, Joe Caraclaw would not believe his eyes. He shook his head and blinked and rubbed his fists in his eyes, for he thought what he was seeing was a dream. There, walking the last few yards to the school gate, was his dog. He stood, for the coming of the dog was terrible. Her walk was a thing that tore at her breath. Her head and her tail were down almost to the pavement. Each footstep forward seemed, to se seemed a separate effort. It was a crawl rather than a walk, but the steps were made one by one. And at last the animal dropped in her place by the gate and lay still. Then Joe, Joe roused himself. Even if it were a dream, he must do something. In dreams, one must try. He raced across the yard and fell to his knees, and then, when his hands were touching and feeling fur, he knew it was reality. His dog had come to meet him. But what a dog was this? No prize collie with fine tricolor coat glowing, with ears lifted gladly over the proud, slim head of its perfect black mask. No, it was, it was not a dog whose bright eyes were alert and who jumped up to bark a glad welcome. This was a dog that lay weakly trying to lift a head, that would, li that would no longer lift, trying to move a tail that was torn and matted with thorns and burrs and managing to do nothing very much except to whine in a weak, happy, crying way. For she knew that at last the terrible driving instinct was at peace. She was at the place. She had kept her lifelong rendezvous and hands were touching her that had not touched her for so long a time. By the labor exchange, Ian Copper stood with the other out-of-work miners, waiting until it was tea time so that they could all go back to their cottages. You could have picked out Ian, for he was much the biggest man, even among the many big men that Yorkshire grows. In fact, he was reputed to be the biggest and strongest man in all that riding of Yorkshire. A big man, but gentle, and often very slow of thinking and speech. 
and so Ian was a few seconds behind the others in realizing that something of urgency was happening in the village. Then he saw it too, a boy struggling, half running along the main street. His voice lifted in excitement, a great bundle of something in his arms. The man stirred and moved forward. Then, when the boy was nearer, they heard his cry. She's come back, she's come back. The, man looked at e the men looked at each other and blew out their breath and then stared at the bundle the boy was carrying. It was true. Sam Caraclaw's collie had walked back home from Scotland. I must get her home quick, the boy was saying. He staggered on. Ian Copper stepped forward. Here, he said, run on ahead. Tell him to get ready. His great arms cradled the dog, arms that could have carried ten times the weight of this poor, thin animal. Oh, hurry, Ian, the boy cried, dancing in excitement. I'm hurrying, lad. Go on ahead. So Joe Caraclaw raced along the street, turned up the side street, ran down the garden path, and burst into the cottage. Mother! Father! What is it, lad? Joe paused. He could hardly get the words out. The excitement was choking up in his throat, hot and stifling. And then the words were said. Lassie, she's come home! Lassie's come home! He opened the door, and Ian Copper, bowing his head to pass under the lintel, carried the dog to the hearth and laid her there. There's a picture. There's Lassie laying on the hearth. Oh, and there's another one that I accidentally missed earlier. Here he is, seeing her for the first time at the gate. <laughs> There were so many things that Joe Careclaw was to remember from that evening. He was never to forget the look that passed over his father's face as he first knelt beside the dog that had been his for so many years and let his hands travel over the emaciated frame. He was to remember how his mother moved about the kitchen, not grumbling or scolding now, but silently and with a sort of terrific intensity, poking the fire quickly, stirring the condensed milk into warm water kneeling to hold the dog's head and lift open the jowl. Not a word did his parents speak to him. They seemed to have forgotten him altogether. Instead, they both worked over the dog with a con concentration that seemed to put them in a separate world. Joe watched how his father spooned in the warm, warm liquid. He saw how it drooled out again from the unswallowing dog's jowls and dribbled down into, onto the rug. He saw his mother warm up a blanket and wrap it around the dog. He saw them try again and again to feed her. He saw his father rise at last. It's no use, lass, he said to his mother. Between his mother and father, many questions and answers passed unspoken except through their eyes. Pneumonia, his father said at last. She's not strong enough now. For a while his parents stood and then it was his mother who seemed to be somehow wonderfully alive and strong. I won't be beat, she said. I just won't be beat. She pursed her lips. And, as if this grimace had settled something, she went to the mantelpiece and took down a vase. She turned it over and shook it. The copper pennies came into her hand. She held them out to her husband, not explaining nor needing to explain what was needed, but he stared at the money. Go on, lad, she said. I were saving it for insurance, like. But how we... Hush, the woman said. Then her eyes flickered over to her son, and Joe knew that they were aware of him again for the first time in an hour. His father looked at him at the money in the woman's hand, and at last at the dog. Suddenly he took the money. He put on his cap and hurried out into the night. When he came back, he was carrying bundles, eggs and a small bottle of brandy, precious and costly things in that home. Joe watched as they were beaten together, and again and again, his father tried to spoon some into the dog's mouth. Then his mother blew in exasperation. Angrily, she snatched the spoon. She cradled the dog's head on her lap. She lifted the jowls and poured and stroked the throat, stroked it and stroked it until at last the dog swallowed. Ah, it was his father breathing a long triumphant exclamation and the firelight shone gold on his mother's hair as she crouched there holding the dog's head, stroking its throat, soothing it with soft loving sounds. Joe did not clearly remember about it afterwards, only a faint sensation that he was being carried to bed at some strange hour of darkness. And in the morning when he rose, his father sat in his chair, but his mother was still on the rug and the fire was still burning warm. The dog, swathed in blankets, lay quiet. Is she dead? Joe asked. His mother smiled weakly. Shh, she said, she's just sleeping and I suppose I ought to get breakfast. But I'm that played out. If I know but had a nice strong cup of tea. 
That morning, strangely enough, it was his father who got the breakfast, boiled the water, brewing the tea, cutting the bread. It was his mother who sat in the rocking chair waiting until it was ready. That evening when Joe came home from school, Lassie still lay where he had left her when he went off to school. He wanted to sit and cradle her, but he knew that ill dogs are best left alone. All evening he sat, watching her, stretched out with the faint breathing, the only sign of life. He didn't want to go to bed. Now she'll be all right, his mother cried. Go to bed. She'll be all right. Are you sure she'll get better, mother? You can see for yourself, can't you? She doesn't look any worse, does she? But are you sure she's going to get better? The woman sighed. Of course, I'm sure. Now go to bed and sleep. And Joe went to bed, confident in his parents. That was one day. There were others to remember. There was the day when Joe returned, and as he walked to the hearth, there came from the dog lying there a movement that was meant to be a wag of a tail. There was another day when Joe's mother sighed with pleasure, for she had prepared the bowl of milk. The dog stirred, lifted herself unsteadily, and waited. And when the bowl was set down, she put down her head and lapped, while her pinched flanks quivered. Finally, there was that day when Joe first realized that, even now, his dog was not to be his own again. So again the cottage rang with cries and protests, and again a woman's voice was lifted, tired and shrilling. Is there never to be any more peace and quiet in my home? And long after Joe had gone to bed, he heard the voices continuing. His mother's clear and rising and falling, his father's in a steady, reiterative monotone, but never changing. Always coming to one sentence. But even if he would sell her back, where'd I get the brass to buy her? Where's the money coming from? You know we can't get it. To Joe Claire Claw's father, life was laid out in straight rules. When a man could get work, he worked his best and got the best wage he could. If he raised a dog, he raised the best one he could. If he had a wife and children, he took care of them the best he could. In this out-of-work collier's mind, there was no devious exceptions and evasions concerning life and its codes. Like most simple men, he saw all these things clearly. Lying, cheating, stealing, they were wrong and you couldn't make them right by twisting them around in your mind. So it was that when he faced with any problem, was faced with any problem, that he so often brought it smack up against elemental truths. Honest is honest. There's no two ways about it, he would say. He had a habit of putting it like that. Truth is truth, or cheating is cheating. And the matter of Lassie came up against this simple, direct code of morals. He had sold the dog and taken the money and spent it, Therefore, the dog did not belong to him any more. No matter how you argued, he could not. you could not change that. But a man has to live with his family, too. When, when a woman starts to argue with a man, well... That next morning, when Joe came down to breakfast, while his mother served the oatmeal with pursed lips, his father coughed and spoke, as if he had rehearsed a set speech over in his mind many times that night. Here's a picture of Mr. Carrickflaw. Joe, lad, we've decided upon it, that is, thy mother and me, that Lassie can stay here till she's all better. That's all right, because I believe, true in my heart, that nobody could nurse her better and with more care nor than we're doing, so that's honest. But when she's better, well, now ye have her for a little while yet, so be content. And don't plague us, lad. There's enough, money to wor enough things to worry us now without more. So don't plague us no more and try to be a man about it and be content. With the young for a little while has two shapes. Seen from one end, it is a great yawning stretch of time extending into an unlimitable future. From the other, it's a ghastly span of days that has been cruelly whisked away before the realization comes. Joe Carraclaw knew that it was the latter that morning when he went to school and heard a mighty booming voice. Mm, as he turned to look, he saw, with an, he saw in an automobile a fearsome old man and a girl with her flaxen hair cascading from under a beret. And the old man, with his ferocious white mustaches looking like an animal's misshapen fangs, was waving an ugly blackthorn stick to the danger of the car, the chauffeur, and the world in general, and shouting at him. Hi, hi there. Yes, I mean you, my lad. Damn it, Jenkins, will you make this smelly contraption stand still a moment? Whoa there, Jenkins, whoa. Why, we ever stopped using horses is more than any sane man can understand. 
Country's going to pot, that's what. Here, lad, come here. For a moment, Joe thought of running, doing anything that, anything to get all these things he feared out of his sight, so that they might miraculously be out of his mind, too. But a machine can go faster than a boy, and then, too, Joe had it in him, had in him the blood of men who might think slowly and stick to old ideas and bear trouble patiently, but who do not run away. So he stood sturdily on the pavement, and he remembered his manners as his mother had taught him, and said, Yes, sir. You're who's his, what's his name's lad, aren't you? Joe's eyes had turned to the girl. She was the one he had seen long ago when he was putting Lassie in the Duke's kennels. Her face was not hearty red like his own. It was blue-white. On that hand, on the hand that clutched the edge of the car, the veins stood out clear blue. That hand looked thin. He was thinking that, as his mother would say, she could do with some plum duff. She was looking at him, too. Something made him draw himself up proudly. My father is Sam Carraclough, he said firmly. I know, I know, the old man shouted impatiently. I never forget a name, never. Used to know every last soul in this village. Too many of you grown up now, younger generation. And by gad, they're all, they're all of them not worth one of the old bunch. Not the whole kit and caboodle. The modern generation, why? He halted, for the girl beside him was tugging his sleeve. What is it? Eh? Oh, yes, I was just coming to it. Where's your father, my lad? Is he home? No, sir. Where is he? He's off over Allerby, sir. Allerby? What's he doing there? The mate spoke for him at the pit, I think, and he's gone to see if there's a chance of getting taken on. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Well, when'll he be back? I don't know, sir. I think about tea. Don't mumble. Not till tea. Damn, very inconvenient. Very well. Well, I'll drop round about five-ish. You tell him to stay home, and I want to see him. It's important. Tell him to wait. When the car was gone, Joe hurried to school. There was never such a long morning as that one. The minutes in the classroom crawled past as the lessons droned on. Joe had only one desire, to have it become noon. And when the last of the laden moments that were years gone were gone, he raced home and burst through the door. It was the same cry for his mother. Mother, mother, goodness, don't knock the door down and close it. Anyone would think you were brought up in a barn. What's the matter? Mother, he's coming to take Lassie away. Who is? The Duke, he's coming. The Duke, how in the world does he know that she's? I don't know, but he stopped me this morning. He's coming at tea time. Coming here, are you sure? Yes, he said he'd come at tea. Oh, mother, please. Now, Joe, don't start. Now I warn ye. Mother, you've got to listen, please, please. You hear me? I said, no, mother, please help me, please. The woman looked at her son and heaved a sigh of weariness and exasperation. Then she threw up her hands in despair. Ay, dearie me, is there never to be any more peace in this house, never? She sank into her chair and looked at the floor. The boy went to her and touched her arm. Mother, do something, the boy pleaded. Can't we hide her? He'll be here at five. He told me to tell father that he'd be here at five. Oh, mother. Nay, Joe, thy father won't. Won't you beg him? Please, please, beg father to... Joe, his mother cried angrily. Then her voice became patient again. Now, Joe, it's no use. Stop, stop thy plaguing. It's just that thy father won't lie. That much I'll give him. Come good, come bad. He'll not lie. Just this once, mother. The woman shook her head sadly and sat by the fire, staring into it as if she would find peace there. Her son went to, t to her and touched her bare forearm. Please, mother, beg him just this once. Just one lie won't hurt him. I'll make it up to him. I will. I will. I truly. The words began to race from his mouth quickly. I'll make it up to both of you. When I'm grown up, I'll get a good job. I'll earn money and I'll buy him things. I'll buy you things, too. I'll buy you both anything you ever want if you only please... Then, for the first time in all this trouble, Joe Carraclaw became a child, his sturdiness gone, and his tears choked his voice. His mother could hear his sobs, and she patted his hand, but she would not look at him. From the magic of the fire, she seemed to read deep wisdom, and she spoke slowly. The mustn't, Joe, she said, her words soft. The mustn't want like that. The must learn never to want anything in life as hard as the want lassie. It just doesn't do. 
It was then that she felt her son's hand trembling with impatience, his voice rising clear. You don't understand, mother. You don't understand. It ain't me that wants her. It's her that wants us. So terrible bad. It's what made her come home all that way. She wants us so terrible bad. It was then that Miss Claireclaw looked at her son at last. She could see his face contorted and the tears rolling openly down, her, down his cheeks. And yet in that moment of childishness, it was as if he were suddenly all the more grown up. Mrs. Claircloth felt as if time had jumped and she were seeing this boy, this son of her own, for the first time in many years. She stared at him and then she clasped her hands together. Her lips pressed together in a straight line and she got up. Joe, come and eat then. Go back to school and be content. I'll talk to thy father. She lifted the, her head and her voice sounded firm. Yes, I'll talk to him all right. I'll talk to Mr. Samuel Caracloth. I will indeed. At five that afternoon, the Duke of Redling, fuming and muttering in his bad-tempered way, got out of a car that had stopped by a cottage gate. And behind the gate was a boy who sturdily, who stood sturdily, his feet apart, as if to bar the way. Well, well, my lad, did you tell him? Go away, the boy said fiercely. Go away, thy tyke's not here. For once in his life, the Duke of Redling stepped backward, he stared at the boy in amazement. Well, drop my buttons, Priscilla, he breathed. The lad's touched. He is. He's touched. Thy tyke's net here. Way with thee, the boy said stoutly. And it seemed as if his determination, in his determination, he spoke in the broadest dialect he could command. What's he saying? Priscilla asked. He's saying my dog isn't here. Drop my buttons. Are you going deaf, Priscilla? I'm supposed to be deaf and I can hear him all right. Now, my lad, what tyke of mine's not here? The Duke, when he answered, also turned to the broadest tones of Yorkshire dialect, as he always did to the people of the cottages, a habit which many of the members of the Duke's family deplored deeply. Come, come, my lad, speak up. What tyke's not here? As he spoke, he waved to Cain ferociously and advanced. Joe Careclaw stepped back from the fearful old man, but he still barred his path. No tyke of thine, he cried stoutly, but the duke continued to advance. The words raced from Joe's mouth with a torrent of despair. This hasn't got her. She's not here. She couldn't be here. No tyke could have done it. No tyke could have come all them miles. It's not Lassie. It's, it's just another one that looks like her. It isn't Lassie. Well, bless my heart and soul, puffed the duke. Bless my heart and soul. Where's thy father, lad? Joe shook his head grimly. But behind him, the cottage door opened and his mother's voice spoke. If it's Sam Claireclaw, Claireclaw you're looking for, he's out in the shed, been shut up there about half the afternoon. What's this lad talking about, a dog of mine being here? Nay, you're mistaken, the woman said stoutly. I'm mistaken, roared the Duke. Yes, he didn't say a tyke of thine was here. He said it wasn't here. Drop my buttons, Duke sputtered angrily. Don't twist my words up. Then his eyes narrowed and he stepped a pace forward. Well, if he said a dog of mine isn't, perhaps you'll be good enough to tell me which dog of mine it is that isn't here. Now, he finished triumphantly, come, answer me. Joe, watching his mother, saw her swallow and then look about her as if for help. She pursed her lips together. The Duke stood waiting for his answer, peering out angrily from beneath his jutting eyebrows. Then Mrs. Caraclaw drew a breath to speak but her answer, true or lie, was never spoken, for they all heard the rattle of a chain being drawn from a door, and then the voice of Sam Caraclaw said clearly, this I give you my word, is the only tyke us has here. So tell me, does it look like any dog that belongs to thee? Joe's mouth was opening for a last cry of protest, but as his eyes fell on the dog by his father, the ex exclamation died. He stared in amazement. There he saw his father, Sam Caraclaw, the collie fancier, standing with the dog at his heels, the like of which few men had ever seen before or would wish to see. It was a dog that sat patiently at his left heel, as any well-trained dog should do, just as Lassie used to do. But this dog, it was ridiculous to think of it as the, at the same moment as Lassie. For where Lassie's skull was aristocratic and slim, this dog's head was clumsy and rough. Where Lassie's ears stood in the grace of twin-lapped symmetry, this dog had one screw ear and the other standing up Alsatian fashion. 
in a way that would give any collie breeder the cold shivers. More than that, where Lassie's coat faded to delicate sable, this curious dog had ugly splotches of black, and where Lassie's apron was a billowing expanse of white, this dog had muddy puddles of off-color, blue merle mixture. Lassie had four white paws, and this one only had one white, and two dirty brown, one almost black. Lassie's tail flowed gracefully behind her. This dog's tail looked like something added as an afterthought. Hmm. And yet, as Joe Caraclaw looked at the dog beside his father, he understood. He knew that if a dog copper could treat a dog with cunning so that its bad points came to look like good ones, he could also reverse the process and make it make all its good ones look like bad ones, especially if that man were his father, one of the most knowing of dog fanciers in all that riding of Yorkshire. In that moment, he understood his father's words too, for in dog dealing, as in horse dealing, the spoken word is a binding contract and once it is given, no real dog man will attempt to go back on it. And that was how his father, in his patient, slow way, had tried to escape with honor. He had not lied. He had not denied anything. He had merely, merely asked a question. Tell me, does this dog look like any dog that belongs to thee? And the Duke had only to say, why, that's my, not my dog, and forever after it would not be his. So the boy, his mother, and his father gazed steadily at the old man and waited with held breath as he continued to stare at the dog. But the Duke of Redling knew, too ma knew many things, too. Many, many things. And he was not answering. Instead, he was walking forward, slowly, the great cane now tapping as he leaned on it. His eyes never left the dog for a second. Slowly, as if he were in a dream, he knelt down and his hand made one gentle movement. It picked up a forepaw, and turned it slightly. So he knelt by the collie, looking with eyes that were as knowing about dogs as any man in Yorkshire. And those eyes did not waste themselves upon twisted ears or blotched markings or rough head. Instead, they stared steadily at the underside of the paw, seeing only the five black pads crossed and recrossed with half-healed scars where thorns had torn and stones had lacerated. Then the Duke lifted his head but for a long time he knelt, gazing into space, while they waited. When he did get up, he spoke, not using Yorkshire dialect any more, but speaking as one gentleman might address another. Sam Caraclaw, he said, this is no dog of mine. Upon my soul and honor, she never belonged to me. Nope, not for a single second did she ever belong to me. Then he turned and walked down the path, thumping his cane and muttering, Bless my soul, I wouldn't have believed it. Bless my soul. Four hundred miles, I would not have believed it. It was at the gate that his granddaughter tugged his sleeve. What you came for, she whispered. Remember? The Duke seemed to come from his dream, and then he suddenly turned to his old self again. Don't whisper. What's that? Oh, yes, of course. You don't need to tell me. I hadn't forgotten. He turned and made his terrible voice. Caraclaw, Caraclaw, drop my buttons. Where are ye? What are ye hiding for? I'm still here, sir. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. There you are. You working? Aye, now working, Joe's father said. That was the best he could manage. Yes, working. Working. A job. Job. Do you have one? The Duke fumed. Well, now, it's it's this road, began Caraclaw. As he fumbled his words, Mrs. Caraclaw came to his rescue, as good housewives will in Yorkshire and in most other parts of the world. My Sam's not exactly working, but he's got three or four things that he's been considering sort of investigating, as you might say, but he hasn't quite said yes or no to any of them yet. Then he better say no and quickly, snapped the Duke. I need somebody up at my kennels, and I think Caraclaw, his eyes turned to the dog sitting at the man's heel, think you must know a lot about dogs. So there, that's settled. Nay, hold on, Caraclaw said. You see, I wouldn't like to think I got a chap into trouble and then took his job. You see, Mr. Hines couldn't help Hines? snorted the Duke. Hines? Utter nincompoop. Had to sack him. No, d didn't know a dog from a ring-tailed filly. Should have known that no Londoner could ever run a kennel for a Yorkshireman's taste. Now, I want you for the job. Nay, there's still some at, Mrs. Caraclaw protested. What now? Well, how much would this position be paying? The Duke puffed his lips. How much do you want, Caraclaw? Seven pounds a week and worth every penny, Mrs. Caraclaw cut in, before her husband could get 
could even get round to drawing a preparatory breath. But the Duke was a Yorkshireman too, and that meant that he would scorn himself if he missed a chance to be practical, as they say, where money is concerned. Five, he roared, and not a penny more. Six pounds ten, bargained Mrs. Careclaw. Six even, offered the Duke cannily. Done, said Mrs. Careclaw, as quick as a hawk's swoop. They both glowed, right, self-righteously pleased with themselves. Mrs. Careclaw would have been willing to settle for three pounds a week in the first place. And as for the Duke, he felt he was getting a man for his kennels who was beyond price. Then it's settled, the Duke said. Well, almost, the woman said. I presume, of course. She liked to taste of what she considered a very fine word, so she repeated it. I presume that means we get the cottage on the estate, too. You drive a fierce bargain, ma'am, said the Duke, scowling. But you get it on one condition. He lifted his voice and roared. On condition that as long as you live on my land, you never allow that thick skulled, screw lugged, gay tailed eyesore of an excuse for a collie on my property. Now, what do you say? He waited, rumbling and chuckling happily to himself, as Sam Caracloff stooped, perplexed. But it was the boy who answered gladly. Oh, no, sir, she'll be down at school waiting for me most of the time. And anyway, in a day or so, we'll have her fixed up so you'd never recognize her. I don't doubt that, puffed the Duke, and he stumped toward his car. I don't doubt you could do exactly that. Hmm, well, I never. It was afterwards in the car that the girl edged close to the old man. Now, don't wriggle, he protested. I can't stand anyone wriggling. Grandfather, she said, you are kind. I mean about their dog. The old man coughed and cleared his throat. Hmm, <clears throat> nonsense, he growled. Nonsense. When you grow up, you'll understand that I'm what people call a hard-hearted Yorkshire realist. For five years, I've sworn that I'd have that dog, and now I've got her. Then he shook his head slowly. But I had to buy the man to get her. Ah, oh, well, perhaps that's not the worst part of the bargain. <laughs> now, it's been 30 minutes and I have a few pages left. I think that I'm going to go ahead and start the last chapter tomorrow and maybe get a start on the next book that we are going to be reading. So, uh, you guys have a great evening and we will see you tomorrow, which will be Friday. Bye.